Welcome to the Times of Industry Show. This is Lior Gantz, and today I'm hosting a returning guest, Gary Christensen. He runs DeviantInvestor.com, and he's a blogger and an analyst I greatly appreciate. Gary, how are you, sir? Doing good. Thank you. Ray Dalio, a person I consider to be one of the savviest investors on the planet, has become increasingly bullish on gold in the recent two quarters. Uh, you can see on the screen right now the uh, holdings of GLD and IAUs that Bridgewater Associates has accumulated in the past two quarters. Now they have about um, group sessions there where everyone must present their case for gold pros and cons and decide what to do. They work with the most advanced computer systems in the world. They run thousands of scenarios regarding how the economy would behave going forward in, in multiple um, likelihoods. This type of aggressive move isn't to be taken lightly. What is the main reasoning to increase gold position today? Well, in my opinion, and we both understand that my opinion is a great deal less valuable than Dalio's, but uh, from my perspective, it is partially in regard to the benefits of gold gold, but substantially in regard to um, the consequences of the rest of our uh, global bubble economy. So let me go through those briefly. Um, looking at gold, um, and I, I don't have figures here, but um, I'm, they're easily available. Gold it, production seems to be flat or increasing only very slowly. And so the supply isn't, um, isn't large. We know that Massive amounts of gold is being sucked up out of the Western world and shipped to, to Switzerland to be um, refined and put into kilo 999 bars and shipped to Asia. So the, the demand is substantial from the point of view of Asia, and the supply isn't large. So from a perspective on gold, um, why wouldn't it be a strong and encouraging um, investment? But I believe more importantly, particularly at this time um, – we have the obvious dangers of bubbles in the world economy. We have a debt bubble. I mean, we have 230-some trillion dollars worth of global debt, and realistically, it's never going to be paid back. And that should encourage people to think, oh, dear, maybe I should have something real like gold and silver. Um, we have bubbles in the stock market. I mean, if you look at a graph of the Dow or the S&P um, – you can see that uh, on a on a on a log scale, those things are very high, and at the peak of of their um, their range, if you graph them on a log scale, and you connect the tops um, from 1987, 97, and up on it, then into 2007, and then 2017. You can see that um, there's they're they're peaking that the Dow is peaking now. There's nothing that says that um, it has to collapse from here. Although I think that's a more likely than not scenario. Um, th there's nothing that says that, but it does say that it's the risk has ris has risen to substantial levels, and the potential reward is a few hundred more points in the Dow. I mean, or or some small amount. Um, so if you were looking at that perspective. Then you would say, well, the risk is high, the reward is small. Why wouldn't I want something real like gold? So, from a financial point of view, in terms of bonds, and from a financial point of view, in terms of the stock market, oh, that doesn't matter whether it's the DAX or the Japanese Nikkei or uh, the SP or the Dow, they all have the same pattern. They all have the same risk reward uh, coefficients there. Danger, don't, danger zone for all of them. So, We've got too much paper in the world. We've got too much debt in the world. We have an excess of, of debt that can never be repaid. Wouldn't it make sense to put some money and some investments, like Dalio has done, into something real like gold? That's my big picture scenario. What do you see as realistic politically for the administration to do in order to try and make the federal entitlements somehow affordable? Oh, that is a tough one because in spite of whatever makes sense, politicians are going to resist any change that restricts benefits. The 
scenario for the last how many decades? I don't know, since uh, 1970. So four or five decades has been borrow and spend. And never mind the consequences, never mind the massively increasing debt. And it's difficult for me to believe that absent a global catastrophe that Congress will change that attitude. Um, I mean, frankly, Congress is owned by a large number of lobbyists and contributions, and those people are all supportive of more debt and more um, more spending. And if and they need um, entitlement spending to not be cut substantially, or else they'll lose their positions in government. So, what do we need to do? What we need to do are things that I think are politically unlikely to ever be able to be done. Um, what we need to do is cut back on expenses, and that means not just entitlements, that means government bureaucracy, that means uh, it, positions in the government, that means military industrial, that means actually uh, control the massive increases in, in um, expenditures for big pharmacy, big ag, um, and on and on and on. And where do you see the likelihood of any of that happening? I consider that extremely unlikely. So I have to say whatever needs to be done probably can't be done except more borrowing and more spending and more debt. Will the U.S. be able to maintain its petrodollar dominance for another decade? The first part of it is what about the petrodollar? The petrodollar, as we know, has supported the strength of the U.S. dollar since 1973. And without the petrodollar, um, the U.S. dollar loses a tremendous amount of its support and demand throughout the world. And the recent events in Saudi Arabia in the last two or three weeks have pointed the direction in a weakening of the credit of the petrodollar and a pointed and pointed towards strengthening relations with China and Russia, at least as I read it. And that says that uh, the petrodollar is weakening and possibly going to be changed. Now, having said that, we have to know that that uh, reserve currency status and these global massive uh, changes in uh, economic structure are slow, and what seems like it should take months will actually take years. So maybe this happens over the course of um, many years. I don't think it's going to happen over the course of decades. I think it's a matter of several years before the petrodollar diminishes in importance. And the critical point is, when will Saudi Arabia start accepting oil payments in Chinese yuan or Russian rubles instead of U.S. dollars? And at that point, um, the game changes. When that occurs, it's very difficult for me to predict. I'm not an expert on Middle Eastern affairs, and you probably have a far better idea about it than I do. But... I think that's the critical point. When is the uh, the U.S. dollar no longer the premier uh, choice for sales of oil? Now, as for cryptocurrencies, um, I've heard, I've s seen a lot of interest um, in cryptocurrencies. We have over a thousand cryptocurrencies, so I'm told. Um, th these are the prices of. Um, uh, the cryptocurrencies as measured in, in fiat currencies just keeps rising and rising. Um, a lot of people have called them a bubble. I suggest that the chart formation for uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies looks like a bubble. But, you know, who knows when these things reverse? Bubbles can last for a great deal longer than you would expect. And as long as the incentive for cryptocurrencies, which is global, which is privacy of your financial affairs and something that isn't controlled by government and um, a market-based money is there and all those things are valid, valid interests, then cryptocurrencies have a place, which leads me to the next point. When does the Federal Reserve, when does the, the, uh, the, the Central Bank of Japan, and when does the IMF produce a cryptocurrency in competition with the other cryptocurrencies that are out there, primarily Bitcoin and a few others. It seems to me that if you have a successful cryptocurrency, that 
the powers that be would want to get in on the act and get their cryptocurrency in use, possibly even discouraging the use of, of everything else, uh, so that they would have more control over the financial system. Uh, I think it's a very fluid situation right now, and I can't make any more predictions beyond that. Now, U.S. coin sales are extremely low, but Chinese coin and bar demand hit the second highest volume on record. In the third quarter, demand for physical metal rose an incredible 57% over the same period last year. Are millennials clueless about precious metals while the rest of the world keeps understanding th uh, the role of gold and silver? Um, in my opinion, yes. I think they're not only clueless and they're, I think they're out of money. Look at the increases in costs for student loans and Obamacare and healthcare in general. Um, it could be that people simply don't have any money to put into gold, and why would they? They'd really be on their on their phones doing Facebook and such. Um, and we've been successfully told for years and years and years that gold is irrelevant. Gold is not part of the financial system. Nobody cares about gold. What we're interested in is stocks, and in this case, bonds. We have interest rates at multi-century or multi-decade lows, depending on how you calculate it. And everybody's interested in the stock market. I understand that um, you know, the retail investor has finally returned to the stock market, um, possibly way too late in the game. And that's where the interest is. It's most certainly not in gold and silver in this country. Um, in the East, where they understand the value of gold, um, they seem to be very much interested in it. So I'm not surprised at the trend of focus uh, in, toward gold in the East. Um, and I am surprised at the, um, the degree of the decline of, of sales in gold and silver here in this country. But they're actively discouraged by the powers that be and actively discouraged by the banking system, the financial system. Um, so, you know, it, it's certainly they have a headwind. Uh, if you talk to most financial advisors, they're not interested in gold. They don't want any money. They want all money digital and under their control, and they don't want it escaping in the form of, of people putting their money into gold and silver. So, you know, we have to know that there's a substantial resistance. Global central banks added 111 tons to their gold reserves last quarter, 25% more than the same period in 2016. Why are they doing this? Well, maybe they realize that gold is real stuff. I mean, you know, supposedly the Federal Reserve still has gold, and supposedly Fort Knox still has gold, and Germany wanted their gold back. Um, you know, in spite of what they say to the public, um, gold is real money and accepted everywhere in the world as real money. And what if they realize that the digital fiat system is um, dangerously unstable? Wouldn't you want gold to back up your... Um, your fiat money to the extent that it would be, just e even to encourage people to feel safer about it. Um, I'm surprised that the central banks are not buying more and more, um, but they seem to be aggressively increasing their, their purchases and diminishing their sales. Now, let's look at supply. I'm showing a chart of peak gold production, which is coming in 2019 before a massive reduction. It's outrageous to think that the price hasn't begun moving higher yet, but Wealth Research Group sees it surpassing 1500 in the first half of 2018 and perhaps experiencing a squeeze towards 2019, taking it even higher into the 1800s or 1900s. Thoughts on how high in real terms gold can rise? Well, um, of course, I'm a a pro gold proponent, so one might consider me quite biased, but it seems to me that on average, the power of gold is strong. And as you say, the availability of it is going to be less and less as we go forward. There are no new gold um, um, finds, the large gold finds um, in the world that I know of. Uh, it takes 10 years on average to get a mine into operation. So we have reason to believe that that as i said before that the temporary supply of gold is flat and probably long term it's it's negative so 
supply should be diminishing. Demand, I can't help but think, will increase as people like Dalio and other people realize that you must have gold to protect your assets, protect your purchasing power, and protect your retirement. In the United States, we don't very well understand that, but Asia certainly does understand it. So we should expect to see the price of gold go up. I expected that the price of gold would hit a new all-time high at the end of this year, and obviously that's not going to happen, or at least it seems very unlikely. But I'm still expecting a new all-time high approaching $2,000 in 2018. And I expect to see silver up going, approaching its all-time highs in 2018. That assumes that the dollar weakens. That assumes that the, the global economy gets more and more unstable and people realize they need to put their money um, and their investments into gold and silver as opposed to the digital things that are, are looking very, very bubblicious. Um, we'll see. You know, maybe, maybe it uh, takes until 2019, but we certainly have new all-time highs in gold and silver on the horizon in the not-too-distant future. My pick is 2018, but we'll see. Total silver supply fell by 32.6 million ounces in 2016. Global, global silver mine production in 2016 recorded its first decline since 2002. Silver supply from scrap is falling and hit its lowest level since 1996. I know the price of silver will rise substantially in case of higher inflation, but how high in real terms can it go? Keith Neumeyer analyzed it at over $110 per ounce. Well, I think that Keith Newmeyer is one of the smartest people in the business, and uh, I would listen to what he has to say. From my perspective, um, let's presume that gold is two to three thousand dollars an ounce in a, in a couple of years. I think that's extremely reasonable, and given our current financial and geopolitical issues, uh, quite quite reasonable to expect. If you take the gold silver ratio, which currently is over seventy and drop it to, say, 30 and you have gold at $3,000 an ounce, that puts silver at $100 an ounce. And as we know from history, when gold starts rising, silver rises much more rapidly. That uh, gold-silver ratio could drop not just to 30 but to 20 or 15 like it did in, um, in the early 1980s, in, in January 1980. And that could put silver well into the $100 to $200 range in a couple of years. If you look at uh, long-term cycles for gold and silver, I see a, um, a cycle low for both of those. And again, you know, you can't trust cycles, but you can look at them as indications. Uh, Long-term cycle lows in gold and silver, uh, 2022, 2023, somewhere in that range. And if that is true, then that means that they could easily hit a high in 2021. Well, imagine how much higher gold and silver could move in three to four years if we have declining production, increasing demand, um, worries about uh, global financial structure, people wishing to move digital assets into real gold and silver. Um, the prices could go sky high. It's not hard to visualize $10,000 gold in a few years if you take um, uh, a worst-case scenario, and particularly if you've read what Jim Rickards has to say about it. Um, and he's an insider who should know. So I I think that it's perfectly reasonable to see $100 silver on the way to even higher in several years after that. Gary, where can people check and read more of your work? Well, I have, um, you know, I'm, I'm, edited, I'm published in a number of places, uh, but my, my own website is deviantinvestor.com, just the word deviantinvestor.com. And I've been writing, um, writing about these articles, these topics, uh, primarily gold and silver and central banking and the economy uh, for over five years. And I've been studying the markets for 30 some years. So, you know, I have my opinions. Uh, people should do their own research and their own um, due diligence. Um, but if they want to read my stuff at deviantinvestor.com. Gary, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You're welcome. Thank you. The most important technical chart to be watching right now is that of a 10-year long tightening wedge in the gold market that I'm uh, th that you're seeing on the screen right now. It is reaching a point of breakout or breakdown. If it goes higher, the move will take it to a, uh, will, will be about $500 uh, and the same if it goes down. So what we're looking at 
basically is the potential to see either gold at 1800 or gold at 800 right now gold's production cost is about eleven hundred dollars across the board for the major um, mining companies so eight hundred dollar gold is completely outrageous and will cause used, huge distortions on the flip side since 2011 gold dropped from 1900 to 1100 at the bottom now resuming a two-year uptrend with oil prices on the rise gold production will become more expensive and with only two to three discoveries a year in the past four or five years peak gold production occurs in 2019 as you see inflation upticking in Europe and in Asia and finally in the US and you see the US equities like the S&P 500 the Dow and the Nasdaq topping this will probably be the green light for commodities personally my biggest allocation that I'm making right now is with first mining finance which is trading under 55 cents Canadian a 52 week low to make money safely with gold stocks you must buy cheap go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash gold ultimate G O L D U L T I M A T E for a detailed overview of first mining finance operations and check the interview I recently conducted with the founder multi-millionaire silver guru Mr. Keith Newmeyer. thank you for joining us